I am ex-detective inspector Walter Henry Thompson and was Winston Churchill's bodyguard for a period of nearly 18 years. In almost any piece of film you'll see of Britain's great wartime leader, this is the man in the background, anonymous and secret. Until now, his critical role in saving the life of Churchill from a series of attacks has been hidden from the wider public. He himself intended that he would never be taken alive, and he issued direct instructions to me. I was to have his four or five Colt fully loaded. He intended to use every bullet but one on the enemy. The last one he saved for himself. After the war, Walter Thompson's censored book told just part of the story. His full memoirs were suppressed even by Churchill himself. Only now can we recount the number of assassination attempts on Churchill's life, many foiled by Walter. This series, with unique access to these incredible memoirs, reveals for the first time the story of Walter's life with Winston. Together they traveled thousands of miles on precarious journeys to meet Stalin and Roosevelt and other world leaders. Together they rode with Lawrence of Arabia, dodged German assassins, were nearly shot down by enemy aircraft, lone gunmen, U-boats and IRA hitmen. This is a story of the political upheavals of the 20th century. Churchill's constant brushes with death and the role played by an ex-post office messenger in preventing an early end to his life. And with this weapon, he was a dead shot. Anyone that came within range of this weapon would never survive. Walter and Winston have now run the gauntlet of the U-boats to cross the Atlantic in wartime. But it was the entry of the United States into World War II on the 7th of December 1941, after the surprise Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor, which brought a whole new dimension of danger to Walter's job of keeping Winston safe. For the next three and a half years, the two men were to travel over 200,000 miles visiting the battlefronts and attending high-level conferences. Traveling by warship, liner, converted bomber and flying boat, they were constantly risking not only accidents and bad weather, but the threat of interception by enemy aircraft or U-boat or attack by assassins. Indeed, before many months had passed, Winston was to come within seconds of assassination by a lone gunman. The United States was now fully in the war. Not just against Japan in the Pacific, but thanks to Hitler's extraordinary blunder in Europe as well. But the new alliance was suffering appalling hammer blows on all fronts. Another meeting of the top leadership was essential, and Winston spoke to President Roosevelt on the evening of the 7th of December. Five days later, he, Walter, and a large party, including the British Chiefs of Staff, embarked on the battleship Duke of York. It was not an easy trip. The weather in the Atlantic was particularly bad. So much so that the escorting destroyers had to be withdrawn and the ship, travelling very fast, belted through the seas without escort. It is easy to underestimate today just how dangerous this sort of wartime journey could be. While the ship was close to land, there was a hazard of mines. Once it was out at sea, the threat of attack by U-boat was ever-present. Winston would not have forgotten that one of his World War I colleagues, Lord Kitchener, had been killed on a voyage to Russia. As the journey started, 
there came appalling news about HMS Prince of Wales, the Duke of York's sister ship, which had been used for the transatlantic trip to Placentia Bay only four months earlier. She had been sent to Singapore with the battlecruiser Repulse to deter any Japanese attack on Britain's far eastern colonies. Two days before the journey began, the two great ships were spotted by the Japanese and sunk by land-based bombers. This was a hard blow for Winston to take. And when I asked him about the crew of the Prince of Wales, many of whom we knew, he replied, I do not know. Later, he mentioned some who had been saved, but he did not want to talk on the subject. He was too upset. But Winston's resilience showed through. During this journey across the Atlantic, meetings were held in the ship day after day. But at night, Winston liked to relax by seeing film shows. Several of these films were westerns, where on many occasions, many people were shot. One western film was shown in which over 12 people were killed. After it was over, Winston got up to leave saying, good night, gentlemen. Then with a little grin on his face, he added, now I think I will have a little peace and get back to the war. After six days at sea, the party landed at Hampton Roads, about 120 miles from Washington. They traveled on by plane. When they arrived, they found that the President of the United States had paid them an unprecedented honor. The President awaited us at the airport, and the two principals left together for the White House. We were driven there in a huge convoy of cars, and this was my first experience of the enormous protective measures thrown around the President. About 12 men followed the President's armored car, which had thick glass windows. What struck me most forcibly was when his car stopped on the way, the bodyguard would immediately line up on both sides of the car, facing outward to see the people around. This seemed to me to tell everyone that the President was in the car, and surely a bomb in the middle would have finished them all. I did realize, however, that having had earlier presidents assassinated, and of course since that time the tragic death of President Kennedy, they had to take every possible precaution. These methods are entirely different from ours, where our Prime Minister is covered only by my colleague and myself. I travel in the front of the Prime Minister's car, and my colleague in one behind. In our travels, we avoid as much as possible drawing attention to ourselves, and most times in going around England, we could travel by car without being recognized. The president had also insisted that Winston and a few close aides, including Walter, should stay at the White House. On arrival at the White House, the president went into a large room where one by one Winston introduced us to him. He shook my hand warmly and said, well, Thompson, I'm very glad to see you again and to see that you have taken such good care of the prime minister. What was to be called the Arcadia Conference began immediately. And over the next three weeks, the British and US chiefs of staff were to have 12 formal meetings while the two leaders held their own private discussions. But it was also Christmas, and the British party took part in many of the White House festivities. On Christmas Day itself came an incident which touched Walter very much. In the morning, there was a knock at the door. A colored maid opened it and said, Mrs. Roosevelt has told me to give this to you. I opened a package and found a very nice tie and small white envelope containing a message which read, Christmas 1941, a Merry Christmas from the President and Mrs. Roosevelt. My colleague also received a similar package. We were not the only ones to receive presents, for everyone at the White House had been remembered, from the highest to the lowest. Shortly afterwards, the President and Winston went to morning service at the Foundry Methodist Church. And Walter once again had an opportunity to marvel at the security precautions for America's head of state. On Boxing Day, Winston addressed a joint session of Congress.
The invitation was an unprecedented honor for a foreign statesman. Winston rose to the occasion. In his speech, he spoke of his American forebears and that, as an Englishman, being welcomed into the Senate was one of the most moving and thrilling moments of his life. Uh, I cannot help but reflecting that if my father had been uh, American and my mother British, <coughs> instead of the other way around, uh, I might have got here on my own. <laughs> As Winston left the Capitol building, came another of those incidents which always made guarding him so difficult. A large crowd had gathered, and immediately he saw them, he walked towards them, giving the V sign. The Secret Service men asked him not to go too close, but all the notice he took was to continue his walk and remark, it is nearly always the unexpected that comes off. Incidents like this always terrified Walter. But he would have been even more concerned if he had known that the next time Winston's life was in danger would come within hours, and that it would happen while he was apparently under secure guard. From Norway to Spain, all of Europe is affected by this unprecedented cold wave. Could the answer lie in a ticking time bomb in the depths of the Atlantic Ocean? Well, a Gulf Stream is a big heat machine. It's taking tropical heat and carrying it into cold regions of the planet. And what if this mystical current was to stop? Politicians haven't quite grasped the urgency of this problem. In a great paradox, could global warming sweep Europe to a new ice age? 8.30 Sunday on SBS. Time to say goodbye to your flatmates? Then check out the Commonwealth Bank's three-year special economiser home loan. With our discounted variable rate and no monthly fees, we help more Australians buy their first place. Limited offer. Conditions, fees and charges apply. Tomorrow's netball champions? We just want them strong and healthy today, don't we? Because at this stage, they can pick up lots of nasty little bugs. But look, only Nestlé Toddler Gold from Nestlé has Bifida Spiel, a probiotic to help protect little tummies from bad bugs. And it makes the best smoothies. What do you reckon, guys? <laughs> Nestlé Toddler Gold from Nestlé. Good food, good life. Good health. Ah, <laughs> uh, Friday. Food tastes better on a Friday. People dress differently on Fridays. People are happier. The sun's brighter. Friday's a fun day, wherever you are. Australia Post is helping local communities celebrate art, promote health, and bring sport and the future to life every day. Australia Post, part of every day. The evening after Winston's triumphant speech to the United States Congress came an incident which Walter never referred to, either because it was hushed up, even from him, or because he had been sworn to total and eternal secrecy. After at last retiring to bed, Winston got up to open a window. It stuck, and as he struggled with it, a dull pain struck him over the heart and traveled down his left arm. His doctor, Sir Charles Wheeler, later to become better known as Lord Moran, diagnosed a mild heart attack. As he put it, a slight coronary deficiency. But Winston chose to interpret it as muscle strain and refused to alter his schedule. Two days later, the prime ministerial party decamped for Ottawa, where enthusiasm rather than lurking assassins presented Walter with his main problems. The welcome we were shown on our arrival there was one of the most outstanding to be received on any of our visits to countries overseas throughout the war. Everyone wanted to shake Winston's hand, and it was quite a struggle to get him and Mr. Mackenzie King to our cars. On Tuesday, December the 30th, 
Winston went to the Canadian House of Commons to address the members. Here, he appeared to be very much at ease, and his entrance was greeted with great enthusiasm. As his speech got into its stride, I had, as usual, been watching his face closely, and I felt that something unusual was coming soon. A humorous look came over his face, and when he referred to the fall of France, and the warning he had given to the French chiefs at that time that England would fight on, he said, When I warned them that Britain would fight on alone, whatever they did, their general told their prime minister and his divided cabinet, in three weeks, England will have a neck wrung like a chicken. Some chicken. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Our visit to Canada being concluded, we left again for Washington by train on New Year's Eve, which carried us out of the old year of 1941 into the new 1942. As midnight approached, the Prime Minister called all his personal staff, together with the white and coloured staff of the train, into the dining car. There, we all joined hands and sang Old Lang Syne, after which drinks were served, and Winston proposed the toast. Here's to a year of toil, a year of struggle and peril, and a long step forward to victory. When they got back to the White House, President Roosevelt, who had no idea that his guest had suffered a mild heart attack, remarked on how tired Winston was looking, and persuaded him to take a few days' break in the sun of Florida. We flew to a villa in Palm Beach, where the utmost security was observed, the press having been warned from Washington to keep away. Although we expected him to relax for the first day, he worked through until 5 a.m. the following morning. The next morning, it was modesty rather than security, which became Walter's main concern. I was standing on the sandy beach with Winston, and he said, Make the best of these few days, Thompson. You need a rest as much as I do. The President has told me to relax and that I shall not be disturbed as nobody knows I'm staying here. I can do just whatever I wish here. I shall certainly enjoy swimming. I mentioned that I would go into town to purchase some swimming shorts for him and myself. To my surprise, he said, I don't think I need any. It is entirely private here, and I have only to step out of the back door into the sea. I noticed then the impish grin on his face as I said, but there are two villas over there, and if they have binoculars, they will see you. The grin broadened as he said, if they are that much interested, it is their fault what they see. Later, he left the villa with a large towel over his shoulder, which dropped off as he walked toward the sea. I picked it up and held it round him as he walked. As he emerged from the water, I stepped forward again with the towel, but he was not concerned with it, though I was able partially to cover him with it. When we reached the villa, he turned to me and said, what are you worrying about, Thompson? We are in a prohibited area. There is no one within miles of us. Moreover, there is no one in the villas you seem interested in. However, a leakage of our movements must have got out, for two women journalists came on to the scene. One came along the beach and persisted in asking questions of one of the Secret Service men who was in the villa. On his refusal to answer her, she suggested that he met her at her hotel that evening to talk. He did not go. Neither did she appear again. This was the only human interruption during the holiday though at one moment it seemed that Walter might have to take on a different sort of attacker. The morning before we left Palm Beach, it was raining, but Winston decided to bathe before leaving. A secret serviceman told me that a 15-foot shark had just swum within a few yards of the shore, but it was thought to be harmless. I told Winston, but he said, I'm not so sure about that. I want to see his identity card before I trust myself to him. 
However, he entered the water and after a swim, he said as he emerged, my bulk must have frightened him away. We arrived back in Washington on January the 10th, 1942. And so, as to continue the secrecy of Winston's movements, the president made a speech in Congress, saying how stirred they had been by his visit and wishing him a safe return home. In effect, we were to remain another five days at the White House. The Arcadia Conference, as it was codenamed, ended with considerable achievements, and ones which particularly pleased Winston. The formal command structure for the United Nations fighting the Axis powers was agreed, which gave the British, at least in theory, equal billing with the United States. The United States accepted that priority must be given to defeating Germany first. And the US High Command reluctantly accepted that the first move against German-occupied Europe would be a landing in North Africa, while building up forces in Britain for an eventual cross-channel invasion. President Roosevelt also gave the go-ahead for a massive increase in US war production. His country would now become the true arsenal of democracy. By the time Churchill prepared to fly home, he had considerable satisfaction, which was just as well, for the next few months were to be among the most worrying of the war. The plan for the return to London was that the Prime Minister's party would fly to Bermuda on board one of the three long-range Boeing Clipper flying boats which had been given to British Overseas Airways for transatlantic flights. Then they would rejoin HMS Duke of York. None of the British had ever seen anything like this aircraft before. The accommodation in the flying boat was amazing. There was plenty of room for everyone. Winston relaxed and wore his rompers for the trip and took over the controls during the journey. The efficiency of the plane impressed him so much that he asked the pilot, Captain Kelly Rogers, if it could make the long journey over 3,000 miles to England. He was assured that it could. Together with the other members of the staff, I was very apprehensive about this, and our voices were raised as to the danger of such a trip. Winston, however, was adamant. He felt sure it was perfectly safe although he knew only too well that flying the Atlantic was still in its early stages. However, he decided to fly. From every point of view, Walter was quite right to voice his objections, for this type of long-distance flying was still extremely hazardous. Only a few months earlier, the plane carrying Arthur Purvis, the head of the British purchasing mission in Washington to Placentia Bay, had crashed. And only a few months later, Brigadier Stewart, the War Office Director of Plans, was killed on his way back from North Africa. These men were important, but not vital to the Allied war effort. Winston was, but typically, he could not be persuaded. Then he made things even worse for Walter. As we left the government house with the governor, Lord Knollys, Winston informed me that he was going in the flying boat with a small party and that I would go with the rest of his staff on the Duke of York. I protested quite violently, especially as I'd been told that the principal members of his party would fly. Lord Knollys was present during this discussion when Winston turned to him and said, the inspector is very sore because he's not coming with me. I still think it's a foolish thing to have all your eggs in one basket, sir, I replied. Winston waved his hand airily and said, we shall be all right, and you will have a well-earned rest on the ship. Before boarding the flying boat the next morning, the Prime Minister shook hands with those going by sea. But when he came to me, it was obvious from his expression that he was not quite happy about leaving me behind for the first time since August 1939. Those of us who were left behind felt very anxious as we waited to hear news of the safe arrival of the flying boat. The Duke of York was not to sail until news of its safe arrival was given to the captain. The news came through the next morning 
but Walter was later appalled to discover that the flight had not been without a major scare. Winston had woken to find the flying boat in thick cloud and the pilot uncertain of his position. Fortunately, he decided to head north, for had he held his course for another five or six minutes, they would have flown into the German anti-aircraft guns defending Brest. It was a double escape, for British radar had picked up what appeared to be an enemy bomber, and fighters were scrambled to shoot it down. In the thick cloud, they were unable to locate the flying boat, and it got through all right. It was fortunate that Walter was unaware of this as he sailed back on HMS Duke of York, for Winston had become an enthusiast for air travel, and many more dangerous flights would soon follow. It's all about passion. Nothing else offers you anything like the thrill. Let's do the maths. This is what cars are all about. Power. A show dedicated to man's second best friend. Top Gear, 7.30 tomorrow. When it comes to super, time can be your best friend. While taking advantage of a fast start strategy might not be an option for all of us, it could make a big difference to your kids. From the day they start their first part-time job, get them investing just $20 a week into super. Doing this before compulsory super cuts in takes advantage of the government co-contribution, effectively turning their $20 investment into a $50 a week contribution to super. Over just four years, this could make a difference of $82,000 at retirement. OK, everyone's different and they need to think about what's right for them. But it is an example of how the right strategy can make a real difference to your super. To find out how, call 133 talk to an AMP accredited financial planner or visit us online. AMP, Australia's number one for super. Full details of strategy and underlying assumptions provided at amp.com.au. A change in any assumptions over time will affect the figures shown. You and I, we will thrive. On love as time goes by Love will show This I know All its splendor When we grow I look at you with a smile You know I'll stay for a while In your love Should a 12-year battle for native title be determined in the federal courts? I don't doubt the legal expertise of the people involved. I just think it's silly. The amount of time and energy and money that we spent, you know, we were better all buying it. That's Living Black, 6 o'clock Wednesday on SBS. Churchill's most immediate danger, as he got back to London in January 1942, was from his own colleagues rather than the enemy. Winston's homecoming was not without incident or embarrassment. For during his absence, a small group in the House of Commons, mostly of the left, had criticised his conduct of the war. He demanded a vote of confidence, which resulted in an overwhelming majority in his favour of 646 votes to one. It was as well that Winston had gained this support. For the next three months, were almost unrelievedly gloomy. On the 12th of February came a local humiliation, when the German battlecruisers Scharnhorst and Neisenau and the cruiser Prinz Eugen were able to break out from the French port of Brest, where they had been corralled and sail, virtually unmolested, up the English Channel to get back to Germany. But the humiliation of British forces caused by the Channel dash paled into insignificance with the news, three days later, that the great fortress of Singapore, on which the whole British Empire in the Far East depended, had surrendered to a far smaller Japanese army. The news reached Britain during one of the weekends at Ditchley Park, and as Walter describes, it was devastating. Winston seemed in a daze. Nothing seemed to remove his despondency, which was apparent to us all. His statement at the time in the House of Commons when he announced the fall of Singapore and described it as the greatest disaster to British arms which our history records showed how heavy an impact it made upon him. As Winston's valet was not with us on this occasion at Ditchley Park, 
He asked for me when he had decided to take his late afternoon nap. He was downcast, overtired and sleeping badly, and he seemed more worried than at any time since I became his bodyguard. He asked me to stop all telephone messages to his room and to see that he was not disturbed. I asked him what had happened in Singapore, and he shook his head and said, I really don't know. 30 minutes later, he sent for me. The telephone ringing had awakened him. Unfortunately, although the operator on the switchboard had stopped calls to him, a line from the secretary's office had been left open to his room, and the call went straight through. He just looked at me in a reproachful manner, and it would have been some relief if this had been one of the occasions for an outburst of Churchillian invective. He was not angry. He was pathetic, and he said in a miserable voice, Sleep for me is finished. I shall do some work. One of the reasons why Winston took the news so badly may have been that, unknown to Walter, he was grappling with an even more serious problem, but one which he could never discuss with anyone but a tiny circle of his most senior military advisers. The vital battle in the Atlantic, the one campaign which might still lead to Britain's collapse, had taken a disastrous turn for the worse. In January 1942, the Germans had added another rotor to their naval Enigma machines. The cryptographers at Bletchley Park, who had been able to read the German codes with increasing success during the second half of 1941, were completely foiled. And it took almost a year before they could break back in fully. Throughout the first half of 1942, shipping losses rose to crisis levels as the Allies struggled to build more escorts and provide more long-range aircraft to make up for the lack of intelligence about the whereabouts of the U-boat wolf packs. Nevertheless, Winston soon bounced back. He was at his best in adversity. It was characteristic of him after the fall of Singapore that although he was unhappy, he faced the world with remarkable fortitude. Small annoyances and criticisms at this time made him difficult. But in time of real trouble, he is at his most human and most pleasant to all those who are around him. Although Singapore's loss had shaken him, he said, we must hold on. All will come right if we have patience. Winston would, in the end, be proved right. But for the moment, things continued to get worse. Late in January, in the Western Desert, General Rommel, who had just been forced back over 300 miles into Libya, launched an unexpected counterattack, which recaptured much of the territory the Allies had gained and brought him back to within striking distance of Egypt. On the 12th of March, General MacArthur, commander of the US forces on the Philippines, had to escape from the Bataan Peninsula by motor torpedo boat. On the 9th of April, the US forces cut off there, surrendered. And on the 6th of May, the remaining troops on the island of Corregidor were also surrendered. A few days later, the Japanese completed the occupation of Burma after the longest retreat ever by a British army. While on the Eastern Front, the limited offensive by the Red Army was brushed aside by the Germans as they prepared to launch their own summer assault on the oil fields of the Caucasus. It was at this low point that the Soviet foreign minister, Vyacheslav Molotov, came to London partly to sign a treaty of friendship with Britain, but mainly to get a commitment from Winston to launch an invasion of German-occupied Europe during 1942. Winston was determined not to do this until a sufficiently large Anglo-American force had been built up in Britain to undertake the extraordinarily difficult job of an amphibious assault on a heavily fortified coast. He pointed out that only two years earlier, when Britain was alone and had just suffered a massive defeat, Hitler had still been unable to undertake an invasion the other way. 
he tried to placate the Russians by explaining how the British were building up their strategic bombing of Germany and planning more raids on the coast of occupied Europe, which would pin down German troops. His discussions with Molotov made Winston decide that it was time for another meeting with President Roosevelt. And he decided to continue with this, even though at the end of May, Rommel was on the move again in North Africa, aiming to outflank the British once more. The battle was still in progress as Winston set off for Washington yet again on the 17th of June. This time we flew in the flying boat Bristol. My most vivid recollection of the long flight was of Winston lying on his bunk at the rear of the plane, dressed in the inevitable gaudy dressing gown and smoking a cigar. The trip lasted 27 hours. After some hours of travel, Winston called me over to find out when we were due to have a meal. When I informed him that owing to the change in the time, it would be several hours before we ate, he exclaimed, my stomach is my clock. I want to eat when I'm hungry, not by the clock. The steward came along and asked Winston if he would like dinner served at once and received the reply, yes. After that, meals were served about every four hours. On this trip, a new game gave much pleasure to Winston. He was almost boyish in his delight at the way it was played. It was known as Short Snorter, a game played around a dollar bill. The bill was used by those traveling by air across the Atlantic and the owner would obtain as many signatures as possible on the bill from other travellers. They must also be able to produce their bill when challenged. If they could not do so, a fine of one dollar was levied. Winston's short snorter was crammed with signatures, so much so that he had to have another one as the years of Atlantic travel went on. Winston's meeting with Roosevelt began at the president's home at Hyde Park in upstate New York. He and Walter traveled there on a small plane which made what Winston described as the roughest bump landing I have ever experienced. Over a weekend at Hyde Park, the two leaders settled the details of what would become the joint US-British Manhattan project to build an atomic bomb and confirmed that a second front in Western Europe could not possibly be considered until 1943. They could take comfort from one bit of good news. In the Pacific, US forces had managed to turn back a Japanese attempt to complete the occupation of New Guinea in the Battle of the Coral Sea early in May. And then, on the 4th of June, in a brilliant ambush close to the island of Midway, substantially outnumbered US naval forces had sunk three Japanese fleet carriers in barely five minutes. A fourth was crippled and sunk the next day. Although it was probably not apparent at the time, the whole balance of power in the Pacific had been totally altered. From now on, the Japanese would be on the defensive, and overwhelming US industrial and military power would steadily grind them down. Winston and Walter then traveled down by the presidential train to Washington and arrived on the 21st of July. Shortly after we arrived in Washington, where Winston was to discuss our reverses in Libya and also Russia's demand for a second front. News came through to the Prime Minister that the ships conveying the armoured vehicles which we had dispatched from England to reinforce our armies in Libya had been sunk. This was a severe blow, as at that time supplies to our armies in Libya had to be taken right round the Cape and through the Suez Canal the time factor being against us. Mr. Churchill mentioned this loss to the president and pointed out that three months would elapse before we could replace these losses. The president did not hesitate for one moment. He said, I have a number of Sherman tanks just ready for issue to our army. You shall have them at once. We will send them to you. The president's gesture was based on more than just generosity. For at the same time that Walter reported the loss of a substantial number of tanks in a convoy, Winston was hit by a much more serious blow. He had just settled into the same bedroom that he had used on his first stay in the White House and gone downstairs to see the president in the Oval Office. 
A message was handed to Roosevelt. He read it, and without saying anything, passed it across to Winston. To Brook had fallen. The garrison had surrendered to a smaller German force, despite General Auchinleck's assurances that it was easily strong enough to withstand a long siege, as had been done the previous year. Winston described it as one of the heaviest blows I can recall during the war. Almost worse, it was an intense embarrassment, such a humiliating defeat in the only theater of war in which the British were actually in ground combat with the Germans. Whatever the reason, the president reacted with characteristic generosity and lack of recrimination. And as Walter said later, at least the British were able to put his gift to good use. The result of this gesture on the part of the president in providing these tanks is only too well known. For in the battles that followed, these vehicles helped the 8th Army to fight their way through Libya and eventually to Tripoli. The loss of Tobruk not only embarrassed Winston during his discussions in the US, but led immediately to a political crisis at home. The reverses were not the end of Winston's headache. For once again, whilst he was absent from England, the critics started to hit out at him. It was a shock when he learned that a motion had been tabled in the House of Commons in the following terms. That this House, while paying tribute to the behavior and endurance of the armed forces of the Crown in circumstances of exceptional difficulty, has no confidence in the central direction of the war. News of this arrived just as Winston and Walter were preparing to return home on the 25th of July. The debate on the motion was scheduled for the 1st and 2nd of August, so Winston had no doubt that he faced an unpleasant homecoming. As he was saying his goodbyes at the White House, he is said to have remarked, now for England, home had a beautiful row. But this assumed that home would be reached. Once again, a long air flight was in prospect, with all the uncertainties and potential for disaster that that involved. But the immediate, and deadly threat to Winston's life would come before they had even got into the air. The 2007 TV Week Logie Award nominations are in, recognising SBS's role in Australian broadcasting. Congratulations to our eight nominees, delivering exciting drama, Leave me alone. documentaries, My name is Richard, and I've got Parkinson. Quality news and current affairs. We're right in the middle of this here, this is bad. And the big premier sporting events. Congratulations to all our nominees and those behind the scenes bringing quality programs to SBS. We're looking for our parents. They've been spending a lot of time here. Here? With me? the most of your retirement and the changes to super. Call a Commonwealth Financial Planner today. Good party, wasn't it? Uh-huh. I thought those people would never leave. Nivea for Men Revitalising Cream Q10 revitalises tired and stressed skin, so you stay looking great. I don't know why you do that to yourself. Revitalising Cream Q10. And now, reduce dark circles and puffy eyes with new revitalising eye relief Q10. Only from Nivea for Men. Advanced face care. Imagine yourself in a Scenic. With five or seven seats, the new Renault Scenic gives you more room for happiness. It had been decided that since time was short, the Prime Minister's party must use the same BOA flying boat that had brought them over. The British planned that the aircraft should leave from the airline's regular base at Baltimore even though the American Secret Service was deeply concerned that the Prime Minister would be exposed to civilian employees, many of whom had not been properly checked out. 
The British side refused to consider changing to a US naval flying boat dock. So fortunately, Mike Riley, the head of the Secret Service team which had responsibility for guarding the president and his important guests, decided to take his own precautions. What happened as the Prime Minister and his party left the United States has never been mentioned in biographies of Churchill, and Walter himself is silent on the subject. This is curious, since Mike Riley became a good friend of Walter's and published a very detailed account of what happened in 1947. I arranged to scatter Secret Service agents throughout the airport disguised as baggage handlers and other field employees. Winston and Walter slipped out of the White House through a tunnel which connected it with the US Treasury building. The President went to the Treasury with them. From there, they were driven through the back streets of Washington and along country roads. Walter, as usual, was in Churchill's car, with Riley himself right behind them. As the convoy neared the flying boat dock, Riley radioed a code word to the Secret Service man at the operations building, which told him to inform Churchill's pilot that the PM's plane should be brought to the dock. When they got to the base, the cars drove to within a hundred feet of the dock. Riley asked the Prime Minister and Walter to stay in the car for a moment, where Walter could guard him, while he checked to see if everything was okay. He later described what happened. As I walked to his plane, I saw one of our agents, Howard Chandler, grappling with an armed BOA guard at the very door of the craft. Howard had the situation well in hand as I reached him. As he rushed the guard by me, Chandler said, this jerk wants to shoot Churchill. In his hand, Chandler carried a loaded gun which he had taken from the guard. I signaled a couple of our baggage handlers to take the guard in tow and Chandler gave me his oral report. I noticed this guard, he's American by the way, I noticed him standing near the entrance to the plane which seemed all right, except that he was muttering and talking to himself. I sort of eased over behind him and beside him and he was saying, I'm gonna kill that bastard Churchill. I'm gonna kill him. So I took him before he could do any harm. The Secret Service men put the guard in a nearby car. Riley then walked back to Churchill's car and said, everything's fine, sir. The Prime Minister did not appear to have seen the scuffle. Riley led him and Walter to the plane and Winston then shook hands with his US guards and said goodbye. The guard was later judged insane and committed. The attempt was hushed up at the time, and no mention of it ever appeared in the press. Riley was convinced that Winston was totally unaware that he had been within one minute of assassination. But in his History of the Second World War, which was published in 1951, Churchill was to write, before we took off, I was told that one of the plain clothes men on duty had been caught fingering a pistol and muttering that he would do me in with some other expressions of an unappreciative character. Walter's job had been to stick with Winston and act as the last line of defense if an assassin did get through. But it was almost certainly him who told Churchill about the attempt as soon as they were well away from the immediate danger. Mike Riley was both a professional colleague and a good friend. He would certainly have kept his opposite number on the British side in the loop about such a near miss on Winston's life. The probability is that it was judged best, both at the time and subsequently in Britain, to keep this very narrow miss completely secret. Amazingly, Riley's account was never reported in the British press when it appeared in 1947, and it may well be that when Walter came to write his journal, he either deliberately excluded it or was obliged to do so by the authorities to whom he had to submit his account. The trip home was uneventful and Winston got back in determined form to face what was the most serious threat to his political survival to be mounted during the war. His position was made worse by the fact that things had deteriorated in North Africa. 
Even as Churchill was flying the Atlantic, Rommel's Africa Corps had attacked again, and the British 8th Army was soon falling back. On the evening before the crucial debate, Auchinleck's men took up their position south of a small Egyptian railway station called El Alamein. It was the last defensible position before the Nile, Alexandria, and the Suez Canal. If the Germans could not be stopped here, then British control of North Africa and the Middle East would be at an end. Even as Winston went to the Commons to face his political enemies on the 1st of July, the Africa Corps pushed on again. As the debate raged, so did the battle in the Western Desert. By the evening of the 2nd, Winston defeated the confidence motion by 477 to 27. And that night, like the political revolt against Winston, the Africa Corps ran out of impetus and at least temporarily went on to the defensive. Winston had survived his worst political crisis, but now he had to throw himself into saving the situation in North Africa. An urgent trip there was essential. He was convinced that the current commanders were no longer up to the job. It would mean even more risky flying down to Gibraltar and perilously close to German fighters based in occupied France. Then across hundreds of miles of empty desert where any navigational or mechanical error would almost certainly be fatal. And finally, up to Egypt, well within range of Rommel's fighters. And if this wasn't enough, once the party reached its destination in the Middle East, the risk of assassination by enemy agents was enormous. For Walter, one of the most difficult periods of his years guarding Winston was about to begin. Next in the news, Kevin Rudd stakes his claim to be Prime Minister. John Howard has a go at the US Congress vote on Iraq. And Stephen Hawking finds a whole new way to be a high flyer. Details after the break.